You're on the internet, this is a website, and you're watching a video. This video is about how to turn a vector graphic into a waveform you can display on an oscilloscope. I'm just going to let this finish because it sounds so cool at the end. That's great. We'll massage four SGV files into oscilloscope shapes, each with their own challenges, learn a trick with text editor macros, and attach a wave file recorder to Apache and Pure Data and other miscellaneous stuff. What we're shooting for is lists of X and Y coordinates that will draw our shape like an Etch-a-Sketch on your oscilloscope. You will need to get some stuff first, but hey, it's all free. You need to have installed Pure Data Vanilla, not Pure Data Extended, it's obsolete, or Per Data to generate the waveform. You'll need Inkscape, the free vector drawing program to illustrate the graphic, You'll need to grab Derek Holzer's Vector Synthesis Master, which will do the heavy lifting and making the conversion. And get the amazing Axidraw Utilities to plug into Inkscape because it's handy for this stuff. It comes from evil mad scientist laboratories. And StippleGen, also from mad scientist. You'll need a text editor that allows for macros. I'm on Windows and prefer Notepad++. And you'll need a pure data patch to record sound directly to disk. That's on my GitHub repository. And you might as well download Rubisco Scopio, since that's going to be our first waveform extractor. I originally had high hopes for Rubisco Scopio, which theoretically does the conversion in one step. But it's very, very picky and wants a single closed SVG object with all straight lines. When it works, it's great. But when you give it something it doesn't like, it either crashes or delivers these spectacular fails. When you have Vector Synthesis Master on your computer, you already have the solution inside the 02.vector synthesis WKT parser folder. Check out this README. And you have a choice of going through all this stuff. Oh, God. And learning some Python. Or you can just listen to me. That's what I thought. Let's start with something simple in Inkscape, a square. Our object needs to be centered on the origin, the upper left corner, so let's zoom in a lot. Also, its values need to lie between minus 1 and 1. So we'll make our square 2 units wide and tall, and locate it at minus 1, minus 1. Now click Path, Object to Path, and now we have individual points. Save it as square.svg. And we can save it again as any one of these other numerous file formats, but the one that's best readable by humans is HTML5. Let's open that HTML file in Notepad++, or any text editor that allows for macro recording. Here's the structure of our simple square, and the coordinates of its vertices. We're going to remove everything that isn't a coordinate, and we'll do the coordinates with some macros. All we're left with are some move twos and line twos. Before we get to extracting, copy the first line, and paste it as the last line to close the square. Before anything else, save what we got as, say, square xy.txt. Now, with the cursor parked at the first character, start recording a macro. We'll control F in Notepad to find the first open parenthesis and close the find window. With the cursor now parked just before the first number, type shift, home, home, and hit delete. Now do a find for that first comma, close the dialog box, and back up to just before the first comma. Hold down shift and end and hit delete. Now hit home 
and cursor down to the next line. Stop recording the macro and let's save it as column 1. Now we'll run the macro several times to the end of the file, and voila, a column of just first column coordinates. Save it as square y dot text. Now reload the original square xy dot text, and let's extract column 2. Parked at the first character, do another find for comma, Close the box, and right arrow past the space, then type Shift, Home, Home, and Delete. Still recording the macro, hit End and Backspace twice. Then go Home to get to the beginning of a line and down arrow. Stop recording the macro and save it as Column 2. And run to the end of file. And boom! a column of numbers that will save as square x dot text and move them into the 01 dot tables folder in the vector synthesis folder so they're easy to get to. Now it's time to run pure data and load up vs object 2d help dot pd. The first thing pull down frequency to something like 60 and scale to about 10. Click the big yellow Open X bang and select Square X. Then click the Open Y and select Square Y dot text. If you're anything like me, you'll want to record this. The way I do it is to Frankenstein in a PD patch. So open up that patch 1606 recorder dot PD. Control A to select all the elements and copy. Now go back over to 2D Vector Help and paste. You can move the whole blue patch all at once by dragging it out of the way. Draw a box around those two inlets, inlet left and inlet right, and delete them. But remember where they're connected to, because we're going to splice the recorder in by attaching the first two outlets on VS Rotate down there to the left and right tilde boxes, like this. Ah, let's stop right here for a moment. After I was finished this thing, I started dorking around with 2D object help and spliced in some code that interrupts the phaser that drives the patch so it writes on and erases the waveform. And I didn't feel like redoing the whole show. You can drag these two sliders to manually create the effect or click the big blue bang to set it in motion. Those arrays on the right show what's happening to the phaser. So go ahead and grab VS Object 2D Help HP Write On and Erase PD off my GitHub and use that instead of my original method. Just pretend it's there as we go forward. Sorry for the hassle. All right, back to business. With the DSP on, look for the record volume control between the two VU meters and raise it about halfway. Click that one record bang, and it'll ask you for a file name. After you answer, recording will begin, and the bang turns red. So we've made a square. If you like, you can now rotate that thing by mousing numbers into the XYZ green rotation boxes. Click stop when you've had enough. The file will be located in the folder where Vector Master lives. Let's take it up a notch now. The order in which the points are drawn is extremely important, so open up StippleGen and I'll explain the Traveling Salesman Problem, or TSP. The first thing that comes up is a picture of Grace Kelly that will be sent to a plotter. When you're plotting, of course, you want the route the pen takes to be as short as possible, and if we make the dot small and click the TSP path, you can see that route. Let's load up this PNG file, a filled circle, and StippleGen starts right away, computing Voronoi cells, placing points, and making refinements. 
Adjusting the white level gets rid of a few stray points, and reducing the number of stipples way down to something like 200 simplifies the path. So let's say the TSP path is an SVG, and we'll call it the circle. Open that in Inkscape, and you know the drill. But drag that out of the group first, because remaining in a layer messes up the numbers in an HTML5. Trust me. Lock the proportions, set the largest dimension to 2, center it on the corner, that's minus 1 and minus 1, and save it as an HTML5. Open it in Notepad, manually delete the extra stuff, and don't forget to copy and paste that first line as the last line. Might as well just make that a habit for each object. Save it as circlexy.txt because we'll need it again. And park the cursor at the first character. We can use those macros we made earlier. You can run a macro multiple times and pick column 1 and save that first column as circle tspy. Go into 2D Object Help again, load into X, and load into Y, turn on the DSP, and here's our crazy circle on the scope. Before we leave the TSP section, let me suggest that StippleGen can help you achieve a gradation of sorts, because it crowds those darker points into clusters, and they get brighter. And it's also an easy way to generate a filled object. Now let's do something with curves. Because I'm a total stud, I chose to make the Playboy logo. This one is a little different because it has curves, and we can't have curves. It's organized into four paths in a layer, so let me pull those out of there. We'll highlight the whole thing, lock proportions, and resize the largest dimension to 2, and locate it at the inverse of the width divided by 2, that's minus 0.65, and y is minus 1. And we'll zoom all the way in. Dealing with curves is no fun at all. The HTML at this point would be packed with these Bezier curve 2s, and our process wouldn't work. So now begins the incredibly tedious process of adding more points on the curves. You can highlight a few equally spaced nodes and click the Insert New Nodes button upper left to do a bunch at a time, but in other places it's just easier to double click on the paths to add more nodes. I'll speed this up to save you some time. The reason to add more path points is to more or less space the nodes equally because close nodes slow the beam down making it appear brighter. This also preserves the shape of the curves. Now that I erroneously think I'm done, I'll go up and add path, path effects to the shapes, the B-spline modifier to be precise, and each shape gets the same numbers. Weight goes to zero, and steps goes to 1. And that shortens all the curves into straight lines. When that's done, save as HTML5, notepad that thing, and eliminate the many non-coordinate elements, adding the first point of each shape to the end to close it. Save it as xy.txt. Object 2D help, and it's obvious 
I didn't add enough points to the bunny's chin. Oh well, next time. The last item up for bids is some single-stroke text, the reason for installing AxiDraw. So here's a word, and with the item selected, we'll load up the AxiDraw Hershey text plugin. There are 18 of these single-stroke plotter-optimized fonts here, but I like Osmotron. Apply, and the letters are embedded in a layer, which we don't want. And that turns on shape fill, so let's turn that off. So we can zoom in and commit path surgery again. After we size for width, and place at the origin, and zoom in some more. Adding points is easily the most tedious part of the process but it makes the scope picture look better because we're adding resolution to two waveforms. You can think of separate objects like a long tube of neon as you anticipate how they'll connect together. Load up and we're done. Alrighty then, we have reached the end of today's journey. I highly recommend you poke around in the rest of the Vector Synthesis folder because there are some great tools and ideas for further development in there. I put website addresses in the description for your downloading pleasure, and be sure to check out my GitHub repository for the Unilateral Phase Detractor project. The frequency you play these waves back is kind of important. If you have a scope with low bandwidth, like the one I'm using, raising the frequency too high will smear the image a lot but too low, and it gets all blinky. So watch that. Don't be too greedy with complicated images. And to the four or five people who thought this video was a good idea, I hope you go forth and teach your oscilloscope some new tricks. I am out. <laughs>